Welcome to the Barrow Bookstore audio series. From the library of the world's best mystery and detective stories, edited by Julian Hawthorne, comes the story of The Man and the Snake by Ambrose Bierce. The Man and the Snake it is a veritable report, and attested of so many, that there be none a wise and learned, none so gainsay it, that yea serpent his eyeth, hath maketh property, that those who falleth into its vision is drawn forwards in despite of his will, and perisheth miserable by a creature his bite. Stretched at ease upon a sofa, in gown and slippers, Harker Brayton smiled as he read the foregoing sentence in old Meyerster's Marvels of Science. The only marvel in the matter, he said to himself, is that the wise and learned in Morister's day should have believed such nonsense as is rejected by most of even the ignorant in ours. A train of reflection followed, for Brayton was a man of thought, and he unconsciously lowered his book without altering the direction of his eyes. As soon as the volume had gone below the line of sight, something in an obscure corner of the room recalled his attention to his surroundings. What he saw in the shadow under his bed was two small points of light, apparently about an inch apart. They might have been reflections of the gas jet above him in metal nail heads. He gave them but little thought and resumed his reading. A moment later, some impulse which it did not occur to him to analyze impelled him to lower the book again and seek for what he saw before. The points of light were still there. They seemed to have become brighter than before, shining with a greenish luster that he had not at first observed. He thought, too, that they might have moved a trifle were somewhat nearer. They were still too much in shadow, however, to reveal their nature and origin to an indolent attention, and again he resumed his reading. Suddenly, something in the text suggested a thought that made him start and drop the book for the third time to the side of the sofa, whence, escaping from his hand, it fell, sprawling to the floor, back upward. Brayton, half-risen, was staring intently into the obscurity beneath the bed, where the points of light shone with, it seemed to him, an added fire. His attention was now fully aroused, his gaze eager and imperative. It disclosed almost directly under the foot-rail of the bed the coils of a large serpent. The point of light were its eyes. Its horrible head thrust flatly forth from the innermost coil and resting upon the outermost was directed straight toward him, the definition of the wide, brutal jaw and the idiot-like forehead serving to show the direction of its malevolent gaze. The eyes were no longer merely luminous points. They looked into his own with a meaning, a malign significance. A snake in a bedroom of a modern city dwelling of the better sort is, happily, not so common a phenomenon as to make explanation altogether needless. Harker Brayton, a bachelor of thirty-five, a scholar, idler, and something of an athlete, rich, popular, and of sound health, had returned to San Francisco from all manner of remote and unfamiliar countries. His tastes, always a trifle luxurious, had taken on an added exuberance from long privation, and the resources of even the castle hotel being inadequate to their perfect gratification, he had gladly accepted the hospitality of his friend Dr. Druring, the distinguished scientist. Dr. Druring's house, a large, old-fashioned one in what is now an obscure quarter of the city, had an outer and visible aspect of proud reserve. It plainly would not associate with the contiguous elements of its altered environment and appeared to have developed some of the eccentricities which come of isolation. One of these was a wing, 
conspicuously irrelevant in point of architecture and no less rebellious in matter of purpose, for it was a combination of laboratory, menagerie, and museum. It was here that the doctor indulged the scientific side of his nature in the study of such forms of animal life as engaged his interest and comforted his taste, which, it might be confessed, ran rather to the lower types. For one of the higher nimbly and sweetly to recommend itself unto his gentle senses, it had at least to retain certain rudimentary characteristics, align it to such dragons of the prime as toads and snakes. His scientific sympathies were distinctly reptilian. He loved nature's vulgarians and described himself as the Zola of zoology. His wife and daughters, not having the advantage to share his enlightened curiosity regarding the works and ways of our ill-starred fellow creatures, were with needless austerity excluded from what he called the snakery, and doomed to companionship with their own kind, though to soften the rigors of their lot he had permitted them out of his great wealth to outdo the reptiles in the gorgeousness of their surroundings and to shine with superior splendor. Architecturally, and in point of furnishing, the snakery had a severe simplicity befitting the humble circumstances of its occupants, many of whom, indeed, could not safely have been entrusted with the liberty that is necessary to the full enjoyment of luxury, for they had the troublesome peculiarity of being alive. In their own apartments, however, they were under as little personal restraints as was compatible with their protection from the baneful habit of swallowing one another. And, as Brayton had thoughtfully been appraised, it was more than a tradition that some of them had, at diverse times, been found in parts of the premises where it would have embarrassed them to explain their presence. Despite the snakery and its uncanny associations, to which indeed he gave little attention, Brayton found life at the Druring Mansion very much to his mind. Beyond a smart shock of surprise and a shudder of mere loathing, Mr. Brayton was not greatly affected. His first thought was to ring the call bell and bring a servant, but although the bell cord dangled within easy reach, he made no movement toward it. It had occurred to his mind that the act might subject him to the suspicion of fear, which he certainly did not feel. He was more keenly conscious of the incongruous nature of the situation than affected by its perils. It was revolting, but not absurd. The reptile was of a species with which Brayton was unfamiliar. Its length he could only conjecture. The body at the largest visible part seemed about as thick as his forearm. In what way was it dangerous, if in any way? Was it venomous? Was it a constrictor? His knowledge of nature's danger signals did not enable him to say he had never deciphered the code. If not dangerous, the creature was at least offensive. It was a de trop, matter out of place, an impertinence. The gem was unworthy of the setting. Even the barbarous taste of our time and country, which had loaded the walls of the room with pictures, the floor with furniture, and the furniture with bric-a-brac, had not quite fitted the place for this bit of savage life of the jungle. Besides, insupportable thought, the exhalations of its breath mingled with the atmosphere which he himself was breathing. These thoughts shaped themselves with greater or less definition in Brayton's mind and begot action. The process is what we call consideration and decision. It is thus that we are wise and unwise. It is thus that the withered leaf in an autumn breeze shows greater or less intelligence than its fellows falling upon the land or upon the lake. The secret of human action is an open one. Something contracts our muscles. Does it matter if we give to the preparatory molecular changes the name of will? Brayton rose to his feet and prepared to back softly away from the snake without disturbing it if possible and through the door. 
Men retire so from the presence of the great, for greatness is power and power is a menace. He knew that he could walk backward without error. Should the monster follow? The taste which had plastered the walls with paintings had consistently supplied a rack of murderous oriental weapons which he could snatch one to suit the occasion. In the meantime, the snake's eyes burned with a more pitiless malevolence than before. Brayton lifted his right foot free of the floor to step backward. That moment he felt a strong aversion to doing so. I am accounted brave, he thought. Is bravery then no more than pride? Because there are none to witness the shame, shall I retreat? He was steadying himself with his right hand upon the back of a chair, his foot suspended. Nonsense, he said aloud. I am not so great a coward as to fear to seem to myself afraid. He lifted the foot a little higher by slightly bending the knee and thrust it sharply to the floor, an inch in front of the other. He could not think how that occurred. A trial with the left foot had the same result. It was again in advance of the right. The hand upon the chair back was grasping it. The arm was straight, reaching somewhat backward. One might have said that he was reluctant to lose his hold. The snake's malignant head was still thrust forth from the inner coil as before, the neck level. It had not moved. But its eyes were now electric sparks, radiating an infinity of luminous needles. The man had an ashy pallor. Again, he took a step forward and another, partly dragging the chair, which when finally released, fell upon the floor with a crash. The man groaned. The snake made neither sound nor motion. But its eyes were two dazzling suns. The reptile itself was wholly concealed by them. They gave off enlarging rings of rich and vivid colors, which at their greatest expansion successively vanished like soap bubbles. They seemed to approach his very face, and anon were an immeasurable distance away. He heard somewhere the continuous throbbing of a great drum, with desultory bursts of far music, inconceivably sweet, like the tones of an Aeolian harp. He knew it for the sunrise melody of Memnon's statue, and thought he stood in the Nile-side reeds, hearing with exalted sense that immortal anthem through the silence of the centuries. The music ceased, rather. It became by insensible degrees the distant roll of a retreating thunderstorm. A landscape glittering with sun and rain stretched before him, arched with a vivid rainbow framing in its giant curve a hundred visible cities. In the middle distance, a vast serpent wearing a crown reared its head out of its voluminous convolutions and looked at him with his dead mother's eyes. Suddenly, this enchanting landscape seemed to rise swiftly upward like the drop scene at a theater and vanished in a blank. Something struck him a hard blow upon the face and breast. He had fallen to the floor. The blood ran from his broken nose and his bruised lips. For a time, he was dazed and stunned and lay with closed eyes, his face against the floor. In a few moments, he had recovered and then knew that this fall, by withdrawing his eyes, had broken the spell that held him. He felt now, by keeping his gaze averted, he would be able to retreat. But the thought of the serpent within a few feet of his head, yet unseen, perhaps in the very act of springing upon him and throwing its coils about his throat, was too horrible. He lifted his head, stared again into those baleful eyes, and was again in bondage. The snake had not moved. 
and appeared somewhat to have lost its power upon the imagination. The gorgeous illusions of a few moments before were not repeated. Beneath that flat and brainless brow, its black, beady eyes simply glittered, as if at first with an expression unspeakably malignant. It was as if the creature, assured of its triumph, had determined to practice no more alluring wiles. Now ensued a fearful scene. The man, prone upon the floor within a yard of his enemy, raised the upper part of his body upon his elbows, his head thrown back, his legs extended to their full length, his face was white between its stains of blood. His eyes were strained open to their utmost expansion. There was froth upon his lips. It dropped off in flakes. Strong convulsions ran through his body, making almost serpentile undulations. He bent himself at the waist, shifting his legs from side to side, and every moment left him a little nearer to the snake. He thrust his hands forward to brace himself back, yet constantly advanced upon his elbows. Dr. Druring and his wife sat in the library. The scientist was in a rare good humor. I have just obtained by exchange with another collector, he said, a splendid specimen of the Ophiophagus. And what may that be? the lady inquired with a somewhat languid interest. Why, bless my soul, what profound ignorance, my dear! A man who ascertains after marriage that his wife does not know Greek is entitled to a divorce. The Ophiophagus is a snake that eats other Snakes. I hope it will eat all yours, she said, absently shifting the lamp. But how does it get the other snakes? By charming them, I suppose. That is just like you, dear, said the doctor with an affection of petulance. You know how irritating to me it is any allusion to that vulgar superstition about a snake's power of fascination. The conversation was interrupted by a mighty cry which rang through the silent house like the voice of a demon shouting in a tomb. Again and yet again it sounded with terrible distinctness. They sprang to their feet, the man confused, the lady pale and speechless with fright. Almost before the echoes of the last cry had died away, the doctor was out of the room, springing up the stairs two at a time. In the corridor, in front of Brayton's chamber, he met some servants who had come from the upper floor. Together they rushed at the door without knocking. It was unfastened and gave way. Brayton lay upon his stomach on the floor, dead. His head and arms were partly concealed under the foot rail of the bed. They pulled the body away, turning it upon the back. The face was daubed with blood and froth. The eyes were wide open, staring. A dreadful sight. Died in a fit, said the scientist, bending his knee and placing his hand upon the heart. While in that position, he chanced to look under the bed. Good God, he added, how did this thing get in here? He reached under the bed pulled out the snake and flung it, still coiled, to the center of the room, whence with a harsh, shuffling sound it slid across the polished floor till stopped by the wall, where it lay without motion. It was a stuffed snake. Its eyes were two shoe buttons. This has been a reading of The Man and the Snake by Ambrose Bierce from the Library of the World's Best Mystery and Detective Stories, edited by Julian Hawthorne. This reading has been presented by the Barrow Bookstore, located in historic Concord, Massachusetts, home of the authors. Reading by Jamie Lee.
Thank you for listening. Join us next week as the Barrow Bookstore audio series continues with readings of short stories and works by Concord authors and beyond. Thank you.